Awesome. Well, good morning. Selena Kozar and I will be um, facilitating today's summit. Um, I'm glad to be here with Peter Krebs. You all, all know Peter. Um, we're going to get started now promptly at 10. Grateful that you all arrived and were able to enjoy breakfast. And um, we're going to go ahead and get started. And as some of you may know from the past two years, we have been online with this. This is our first time gathering in person with this summit. So congratulations for being here. Yay for us for making it this far um, to be able to do this together in person. Um, and, you know, we figured out a couple of ways to make it work online. And, and one of the ways that we're going to continue to work that we did before was that we have a, a full community document on Google Docs that we want you all to enter your notes from your, your organization, your groups that we have later on in the day. And so you'll see signs up around the room with the bit.ly link where you can type that in and access the Google Doc so that when you take your notes, you can add those to the community document. And, um, and it's not only for that, like this is how we run our meetings. We, we don't have a secretary, we all take notes. So feel free to assist with the note taking for this whole event so people who can't be here can also benefit. But there's many people who said they wanted to come as we actually were able to come, so yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We had about 50 people um, register for today. So there'll be some people who are coming later. And um, so we're excited that we have so much interest today. Um, so as you may know, those of you who are here, um, we are also broadcasting on Zoom and welcome to those of you who are joining us remotely. Um, we're glad you're here too. We apologize for the backlighting that we can't control, but we're grateful for the sunshine. We just can't control where it lands in the room today. So we're glad you're here. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, if you are speaking, we've got, you can see like the green lights in the ceiling. That's where the, the mics are. So if you can project your, your voice toward that. So the people who are joining us remotely or looking at the um, recording later can hear your comments or questions. Also, if you have a phone that talks to you or makes noises or um, a computer that um, dings, if you would put those on mute so that those aren't distractions to us during the day. And if you need to take a call or, or respond to something, feel free to step out um, and take care of that. Speaking of taking care of yourself, if you have, if you need to take a bio break, the bathrooms are just down this hall to my right. And there's also a kitchen back there. So if you are in need of water, if you want to use one of the lovely cups that have been provided for us today, um, you can use your cup and grab some water back there when the water back there with the food runs out. You can also get water in the kitchen. Um, also, just as part of the housekeeping as well, is that we are a room full of equals. Everybody is here and has an equal voice. So some of us are more talkative than others. Some of us um, have lots to say, and some of us like to contemplate internally. And I just want to invite you to as appropriate, step up and step back. And what that means is that if you are a person who, who has lots to say, if you just think about this, a room full of people and there might be others who wanna add some things, so be considerate of that. And then also, if you are a person who processes internally and has lots of ideas that you keep to yourself, we wanna invite you to share some of those with us too, um, because we are a room full of equals and we wanna be able to collaborate together and really, benefit from the ideas that we can share together. So I'm going to hand the mic to Peter, who's going to give you a little bit of background on the summit and peace. Yeah, so thank you. I'm Peter from the Piedmont Environmental Council. How's everybody this morning? Good. Sunny, Good. Peter. Sunny day. It's, it's great to be out and it's great to be together. Um, so how many of you have been to a Piedmont Mobility Alliance meeting before? How many have not been to a Piedmont Mobility Alliance meeting? 
So that's awesome. It, it's it's a good number. So there are um, signs around that talk about what the Mobility Alliance is. Um, I don't like reading scripts, but we worked really hard to craft our our motto and language does matter. So I'm just going to read you what we are and what our um, beliefs are. So the Piedmont Mobility Alliance is a coalition of organizations that coordinate advocacy, planning, and actions toward a common vision of a safe, comprehensive, and connected infrastructure for walking, running, and biking in Charlottesville and Albemarle. The Alliance provides resources, inspiration, coordination, and focus for a more connected community. We believe that everybody in our community should have inclusive and accessible walking and biking options that connect them to education, employment resources, and recreational opportunities. These opportunities must be safe, comfortable, and free from physical or systemic barriers for people of all ages, abilities, races, ethnicities, genders, and socioeconomic status. Meeting this essential standard makes our community healthier, more sustainable, and more just. So I read that because that's why we're here, and that is always our lodestar. Um, if you are a part of a group, or if that um, simply resonates with you, and you're not already part of the Mobility Alliance, we invite you to join. It's uh, it's free. It, Mobility Alliance isn't a nonprofit or anything. It's just a coalition of independent groups and people. And the only uh, requirement that we ask of you is that you be an active contributor to the, for the goals that I laid out just now. Uh, we've done particularly well, and I think we're a model that people in other parts of the, the country and the state look to, precisely because we do pull together individuals, organizations, uh, nonprofits, and multiple governments, Albemarle County, Charlottesville, uh, Commonwealth of Virginia, the planning district, et cetera. So um, that's our strength. And, and this is an embodiment of it. This room has people from each of those groups. Um, I'd like to also take just a quick minute to thank our sponsors. We couldn't have done this live in this way if it weren't for the sponsors. First and foremost, the city of Charlottesville for hosting us, providing the room. Albemarle County, who has provided tons of technical support. Uh, the Bama Works Fund at the Charlottesville Area Community Foundation. The Community Foundation has been with us since we started five years ago, so they're keeping us going. Of course, the Piedmont Environmental Council, I'm here and a couple of my colleagues are as well. Public Lands, Sentara, Martha Jefferson Hospital, and Wegmans all contributed significantly financially. Uh, note that everybody that I just mentioned is not just here for this event. All of, all of us are present throughout the year and, and very visible. Uh, one quick announcement uh, regarding the Mobility Alliance is that we've selected a time and date for our next meeting, which is gonna be Friday, April 21st at 2 p.m. Most of our meetings are on Zoom and that one will be like that as well. So, right. So uh, we're here for a couple of purposes really. Uh, Number one is to celebrate successful collaborations that have happened throughout the year. And that's extremely important. And it, it, you know, I talk about our mentors who got us where we are today. They've all been very um, consistent that it's very important to come together and um, celebrate successes. There's a couple of reasons why. Um, first one, the one that I name off quick, is that nothing sells like success, right? People see you doing well. It's, it, it's more interesting to get involved with something that's actually working. So uh, while we show our work, it's important to show our successes as well. Um, second, it shows other people that uh, better things are possible and motivates you know, others to get involved or to do good work that's related. Like a lot of our successes or things that I view as success but won't claim credit for are things that actually other people are doing. We may not even see it. 
And then last of all, it keeps us going. It, it's, it's better to be involved in a fight when you're a happy warrior. And that's what we um, strive for as well. So um, I've been super inspired by a whole bunch of things that I've seen around the community all the time, just constantly um, cropping up. Um, but um, we had la laid aside a certain amount of time this morning right at the top to just have a discussion about what are some of the things that we've uh, been most excited about, things we've witnessed, things that we've been a part of already. And um, one of our morning exercises, those sort of station exercises, invited people to write some of their, their favorite achievements and successes for connecting community. And we're thinking connectivity in both ways. We're thinking about the physical fact of getting more people moving, communities better connected, but equally important, and this is one of the ways where we're really doing well compared to other areas, is pulling groups and sets of people from different groups. And one uh, organization might have resources, another organization might have tons of volunteer capacity. Someone might have a genius idea, but lacks funds and lacks you know, a volunteer base. You know, a, a government uh, agency might be doing work, but they need volunteers for it. Lots of ways that, that we can benefit from working together. Um, I would invite you all to um, uh, share some things that you've seen out in the community. And um, I have a whole list and I can call on people, but I think it's, it's more friendly if people um, shout out their own ideas. So, um, I guess, like, raise your hand and let, let's hear some things we're excited about. I see Ali in the corner. Um, the Ravana Trail Foundation is hosting monthly Loop to Bill hikes. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Ravana Trail, it's been circled Charlottesville, about a 20-mile loop. Um, and then we have a seven mile Northern Spur and every fall we've been having a loop to Ville where we um, have guided bike rides and hikes around the, the main loop. Uh, but one of our board members has volunteered to do section hikes of the trail throughout the year. So once a month he picks a section and then guides people along it. And last month was the first one. We had over 50, 60 people show up. So the next one is this Sunday. Um, we're gonna be meeting at Charlottesville High School at um, 10 o'clock or leaving at 10 o'clock to arrive a little bit early. Come join us for a section. Ellie, may I ask you a follow-up question or two? Of course. Yeah, so um, why is it important to have a Loop DeVille festival? We had an awesome trail and it, it's nice, but how does the Loop DeVille um, do more than just be fun? Awareness of what resources we have right here in our town that everyone has access to, connectivity, um, you know, transportation. What I love about the Ravan Trail, it's this urban trail that is mostly in the woods, but you do have to kind of hop out on a city street and maybe follow a neighborhood road to get to the next uh, copse of trees, and it can get hard to find. And so um, Loop Deville and um, events like the monthly walks will get people more comfortable being out there on their own. Um, for those of you who haven't been on it in a while, we've done a lot of signage improvements and spray painted arrows on the ground to try to facilitate. So hopefully you can lead the whole thing yourself, um, so, you know, do the whole thing yourself solo without a guide, but um, anyway, come on Thank out. Thank you. Yeah, so um, uh, one of the cultural features of the um, Mobility Alliance, and it's one of the reasons why we are successful with, with a pretty unwieldy and diverse coalition is that e each of us know our mission and are the most empowered to, to say, you know, here's what's going on. So um, Ali's on the board of the Ravenna Trails Foundation, and it's not for me to say what the RTF is about. But one thing that I will um, observe uh, also is that uh, the Ravenna Trail is a amazing resource that is less well known than you might think it would be. And so they've been very methodical over the last two years, really making it clear, like, here's a trail. If you follow this, you're not going to get lost. It's right over there, you know, you know, <coughs> to um, uh, 
the right image trail. Uh, what other uh, shared successes are out there? So, um, this is not like personally an effect of mine, but I was really excited to see the lights go up finally at the skate park um, over at McIntyre, just because I'm connected to Matt and Janine who own Seville Skates. They started in the back of our shop initially before getting their own space. <coughs> And I know that they did a lot of work across multiple agencies really advocating for that to happen, um, particularly with our mild winter this year. I think it was an awesome resource to make that available to kids and adults <laughs> realistically. Um, so yeah, when the, when the lights finally went up, I know they'd been really working hard to try and bring that together for a couple of years. And I was excited to see that, yeah. though I personally am not a skater. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, this, this idea of who is the skater, what is the skater, mm -hmm. is I think something that people carry assumptions about. Mm -hmm. And I would really invite folks to go to the skate park and, and then see if your assumptions are about who's the skater are the same. Uh, and the, the lights make it more available. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to, um, I think that's a great point. And um, just personally, I'm not a skater either, but my husband and son are. and it's much more convenient for them to use the park at night. And in terms of <clears throat> what it achieves for transportation and connectivity, it's giving my son, he's 11, a ton more confidence in his ability to get around without the need for to be driven somewhere. Yeah. So and yeah. thanks for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see Chris. Chris with City of Charlottesville, the Riverfront Trail has long been the, the Riverview area up to VFW. Um, I'm not sure a lot of people know that Penn Park has a mile and a half of Riverfront Trail, but it's an old roadbed effectively. It's not a paved um, accessible surface. Uh, recently, a subdivision was built near Penn Park and they um, put a bridge over Meadow Creek. And that's one of the three things between the Riverview Trail and the Penn Park Trail. So that bridge is up, obstacle number one is down. And we recently talked with the golf course at Penn Park about bringing a trail through the golf course from Meadow Creek around the corner so you can get onto that lower pen trail that most people probably don't even know is there. Um, you have to get there from the fitness trails. So that's obstacle number two seems to be falling right now. Um, and we're currently talking with some of the property owners between BFW and that bridge because there's only about six um, that have never signed any legal easements. But the idea being the entire Charlottesville riverfront would be publicly accessible with this trail system. There's just this third of a mile gap right smack in the middle that we're slowly building. So I wanted to credit the golf course with saying, let's be partners here and find a way to put a trail through the golf course where everybody's safe and happy. Um, that wasn't necessarily something people would have done about five years ago. Well, I don't think back then, it was a public park, but it was, I didn't think the golf course would be really thrilled about a trail through the middle until I learned the WNOD trail goes right through the town of Hurton's golf course. And if the WNOD can do it, uh, we can do it here. So that's a big step forward. We just have to get it built now. Now it'll be a nature trail for a little while until we can pave it. But the, the idea is to connect all this stuff together. You get all the way up to Belvedere and hopefully Ivy Creek someday. In DC, is the Anacostia River Trail also goes through a golf course and it feels like you're in a batting cage, but you're protected. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. You know? I have actually had golfers like tee off on me and I'm like, I'm quicker than you. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's one reason why um, active being active is good. It protects you from flying golf balls. What other um, triumphs? There are many. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the Charlottesville Bike Fest uh, last April was a success. Uh, Charlottesville Criterium Bike Fest uh, on Preston and Rose Hill uh, attracted over 200 cyclists for a first year event, <coughs> hundreds of uh, spectators. And so we're returning for a second uh, year this year on April 29th in the same area. And uh, we have a lot more, um, we have a lot more time to promote it. So we should have a lot greater turnout. And it's, um, we're pairing with UVA to um, host a, a road race called Jeff Cup in Albemarle County the, the following day. So it's going to be the uh, ACC Cycling Championship weekend. So um, all the universities in the Mid-Atlantic are going to be coming along with amateurs. So we're expecting somewhere around 350, 400 cyclists possibly, and hopefully maybe 500 to 1,000 spectators. So Ethan, does that mean that some of the, and maybe this is precisely what you mean, but that a bunch of those NCAA level cyclists will be on the on-street race? That's well? right. 
Yeah. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I said half of what we're doing today, half of what we're doing is celebrating successes. And then the next half of the meeting is going to be about working together to build on successes and you know, forge these collaborative work, work products. And hopefully then you'll have, you'll uh, work with one of these sessions this afternoon so we can like do our part to help with the criterion. Um, I saw Lonnie Murray before, are you? Do yeah. you have one? Yeah, so um, I was gonna say one success is, you know, connecting with Loudoun County about their efforts to protect gravel roads. And educating our, our local super, our county supervisors about the importance of gravel roads to the community and putting in place a few more reviews than there are now um, before those roads get paved um, because they can really impact the ability of people to access safe running and walking in the rural areas. Excellent. Uh, one quick thing. Hey, Will, there's seats up front if you, if you like to sit. Michael. Uh, <clears throat> just at a kickoff meeting for the uh, Fifth, Street Trub, Fifth Street Trail Hub project, which is down by Wegmans. Uh, so engineering has become an, an earnest. I think they've done some surveying this past week. So, uh, you know, it'll take us several years to build that, but eventually there will be a trail connecting Wegmans to the Starbucks, which I guess you can get coffee at both places. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and not only that, it'll hopefully be the future connector to um, Biscuit Run Park and beyond. Yeah. Well, it's a, the beyond part is what interests me as a planner. Yeah. Well, well I, it, it's a hub. So one connection to Biscuit Run is only a spoke. Right. right. Make it a hub at that yeah. point. Yeah. And we'll, we'll do another dive on that in just a second. Um, Alberic. Were, were you just plus one or did you have one you wanted to share? Peter. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to keep building on what Michael said. We both work at VDOT. Um, so another VDOT piece of information is that we have a state trails office that's being set up. Um, so the staff are, I think, being hired um, now, two folks to start. And they've been told by the legislature what quote unquote trails they're going to be looking at first. But that's kind of interesting. And then switching to the City Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee, which I've been participating in for several years, and I don't see other folks that are regular attendees. Thankfully, I'm no longer a chair or vice chair of it. We have some new leadership, um, and that's good. And also, the, the city now has its first transportation planner um, that was hired within the last year. So I think that's a big win. And it's, you know, it's a great idea to have somebody whose job is to do that. Yeah. Kind of crazy that it didn't exist before. <laughs> Not to dominate, but one more thing. Let me think about it. Uh, you know, the Trails of Mobility Office recently digitized the bike infrastructure in Charlottesville. It had been, they were one of the, Charlottesville was one of the few localities that hadn't digitized its bike uh, lane, the bike infrastructure. It hadn't done it in a way that it had gotten to VDOT. So VDOT um, did that. So it can be included in the rest of the state planning databases. So that's something that'll be out there. Um, Alberic, you do have your hand up. Yes, um, this is being spearheaded a lot by Jessica, but right now we're in the process of uh, making Freebridge Lane, which is that kind of small road on the county side of Rivanna Trail by Freebridge Bridge between, I guess, that and Darden Tau into more of a promenade. Um, there's no final design yet. We're still working with our consultants and things, but we're looking at either having a fully pedestrian bike promenade along the river or also alternatively like making it a one way. So you have um, cars being able to go one way, I think, from Darden Cow, I guess, to 250, but still keeping it as a nice place to walk with like benches and art and you know places to view the river as well. So that's something that we're working on. Yeah. So that section between Darden Tow and Freebridge. Pretty quiet street. Yeah. Doesn't seem like a great opportunity to make it car free or very few cars. Yeah. So, so that's an awesome, um, awesome development. Lauren, I saw your hand. Yeah. Right. So community bikes two years ago in this group, we worked with a number of you to figure out our mobile clinic program, which is taking a trailer into communities and doing bike repairs. 
which is a consistent thing we're doing now, but what we've, we've done a couple where we've gone and less kids had bikes than, uh, less people needed repairs and more people needed bikes. And so we're, that's a thing that we're trying to figure out now is how to um, expand on that program to include more bike deliveries for those events and consistently get bikes to kids who need them but can't make it to the shop. Um, so there've been a couple events that we've done where we bring bikes and give them away before the event, but um, just trying to figure out how to, how to manage it. And so that in partnership is much better than that us, than us trying to figure that out alone. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I mentioned before about how the um, ha how we, we re see each other in lots of <clears throat> popping up in lots of different ways. So, community bikes is a great example of of an organization that um, helps out in a lot of different ways with with different events. So they have their shop, they have their mobile clinics. They also are instrumental partners in a number of community bike rides where. I got to tell you, as, as you know, sort of a, a reluctant leader of, of bike rides, it's a lot easier if you know there's a qualified bike mechanic along that, you know, even might even have an extra seat on their tandem bike or, or something <laughs> like that. So um, uh, I'll, I'll share one, which is uh, exciting. Um, so uh, Michael and I were, were hitting tennis balls about back and forth about Fifth Street Trails to Biscuit Run and beyond. And um, we're talking about a little bit different things, but the beyond is super important also because when we think about that, that trail that leads out to Biscuit Run Park from the city, it also leads to Southwood. But uh, currently you can't get to Southwood because the creek of Biscuit Run is, it's like a, medieval moat or something, it's, it's uncrossable. So uh, PC uh, got a grant from the Jinan Foundation and we're working with the county, uh, Habitat for Humanity and others to engineer a bridge that gets built much quicker than the county had planned to connect not only Southwood residents to the park, which they can see from their window. We'll talk more about that type of stuff in a minute but also that, that connects Southwood to uh, Fifth Street Station and ultimately to the, the whole city. So that little bridge, it's gonna be very important. Do you know when that bridge is gonna be there? Is so uh, so um, I'm careful about speaking on behalf of others, but the original plan was for it to be in something like fiscal 28 of the counties. Biscuit Run rollout, um, any county officials feel free to correct that. Our idea is to get that moved ahead like three years sooner. So more like 2025 rather than 2028. That's that's our hope. Yeah, yeah. Um, hey, Gabe, with Elmore County, I, I think, uh, I guess a success in a similar one that I had nothing to do with and so won't take credit for, but I watched it across the street um, is about a three quarter of a mile sidewalk went in on Avon extended between the Lakeside Apartments and Mountain View Elementary, mm -hmm. Elementary School or the past fall. Um, and so uh, it should, uh, I've walked about half of it, but it should allow, you know, if there are elementary school age kids who live in those apartments or in Mill Creek to be able to walk to school. Um, and then I, I'm excited to, you know, for kind of the next step of building on that success and, you know, hoping that that can then be extended to cross the bridge that goes over 64 and potentially connect folks like if they live in this area and they work in fifth street station you know to be able to bike to work or something like that eventually get it connected to across morris creek into the city and i i think there are plans to do that but it was nice to see a good chunk of that planned connectivity um go in in a way that'll you know maybe help some kids be able to walk to school yeah, so, so that triumph belongs to Albemarle County and the residents of Albemarle County, but it's not coincidental that, that all of us have been advocating for the last couple of years for improved sidewalks on places like Avon, Rio Road, Commonwealth. You know, Albemarle County is a significant urban population that uh, ought to have infrastructure that's appropriate for 
you know, towns and cities and places where people live. So thank you, Albemarle. Let's see Jessica back there, one of the county's transportation planners. Thank you for the good work. Now let's do much more. Um, <laughs> any other? Um, uh, hey, Peter, I'm... <clears throat> Yeah. Can you hear me? I'm Michael online. Um, I did but, have, uh, I guess, uh, this maybe predates Jessica, but there's been uh, sidewalks put in on uh, 29 on southbound side with new places like the uh, car wash, and they put one in at the uh, right next to CVS, and they're going to put one in up by. Uh, there's a new thing between the two car dealerships, but 10 foot wide paved. It's like, okay, they don't connect anything yet, but they're there, so it's great. Um, not to put you on the spot, Jessica, but do you have any idea of when the pedestrian bridge over 29 should be getting started? Um, I, would re I would refer you all to the uh, VDOT website for that project. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I can tell you that they are um, they're getting ready to solicit. Uh, I think they've already gotten the bids back from several firms and they'll be reviewing those firms for the design bill contract. They're hoping to start, you know, probably the next three to five months. Is that the Zan Road crossing? It is. Okay. Yeah. As well as several other improvements in that area. Okay. Yeah. So we talk about quality of life, but we're actually talking about the life and death also in many cases. So mm -hmm. uh, so crucial. Um, other um, uh, other triumphs or exciting things. Chris? Nice work. Um, finally, working with Freddie at Love No Ego um, to officially have them adopt the Hayward Forest Trails. Um, they bring youth out there all the time as part of their mentorship program for trail activities and hikes. But part of that is they do volunteer work out there on the trails. So um, we've started an adopt a trail program. So the groups that do that can put a sign out and say, hey, we're doing good things and more people can learn what these good um, groups are around town that do these wonderful things and maybe give them some more support. Kind of, We can both build each other's uh, strength and numbers kind of thing. So Freddie's been going out there for quite a while with kids, taking them in vans up there. And um, Hayward Forest and Ragged is so close to town. It's nice to know that the kids from um, in the city here can get out to something like that because they may not ever get out to like Shenandoah and places that are further away. So it's nice to have groups like that. Um, love no ego, come as you are. With some other groups I know that are working around town to do those sorts of things. Um, I, I saw Freddie just yesterday and I, I tried to get him to come to the summit, but he was um, quick enough to dodge golf balls, but not enough to <laughs> catch him in his van. Um, but that's super exciting. And um, by the way, I, I didn't. Um, uh, I didn't mention this, but I come as you are, they're a member of the Mobility Alliance too. So, um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, and uh, others, there, there are more. <laughs> there are some more. Um, uh, I, nobody mentioned the raise grant, for example. Um, uh, Jessica, yeah. I can talk about this. Um, so, Amar County was awarded just over $2 million to complete planning for um, a shared use path connecting. The western side of the city of Charlottesville through Crozet um, over to the Blue Ridge Tunnel um, in Afton. So um, you won't see any construction happening anytime soon, but what this means is we get to look at that whole section as one big chunk. Think about what the what a, a route would look like that makes sense all together. Have um, some plans in place ready to hand off to construction workers um, so that we can build bits and pieces as funding becomes available. So it's a really important first step that looks at this section holistically and allows us to move forward whenever the opportunities present themselves. That's amazing. Um, and on a similar note, the Planning District Commission, like right now, it's due next week, is submitting a raise grant to do the preliminary engineering for the Ravenna River pedestrian bridge and also the connector to um, to the hospital and to the Pantops neighborhood. So um, so that's all that's awesome. Any other um, uh, ones that uh, they'd be interested to share? 
Oh, there's somebody to share something in the chat. Okay. Should I just read it? Yes, please. Yeah. So William Palmer says, hi, William. Very you beautiful. Um, I generally view the transformation of McIntyre Park as a success, not just the skate park. There are tons of folks commuting through because of the paved trail and tons of people walking and running the grass trails, exploring the arboretum trails, et cetera. So. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, any other items in the chat? Cool. Well, um, this is all all great triumphs. Um, I think there's one other um, that I'd like to share that I'm super excited about, and the timing is good. Um, so a, a number of us were involved with the Fifefield Trail, the Fifefield Community Trail is now the name of it, that connects um, uh, Tonsler Park to uh, Fifth Street to Greenstone on Fifth, which is an income limited uh, housing community, and also to the neighborhood. So um, the Fifefield Trail provides easy access for kids who used to have to walk more than a half mile along Fifth Street just to get to Tonsler Park, and nobody wants to walk on Fifth Street or ride their bike. Now they have a direct route. And it's also um, a, a super natureful environment as well. So um, that's amazing. That's the result of the city, um, the Rivanna Trails Foundation, Virginia Outdoors Foundation, PEC, the, um, uh, and a number of other groups that I'm probably forgetting, but most particularly the Fifeville Neighborhood Association who took the lead on that. And speaking of Fifeville, um, Colonel Lead is here. So that's that's amazing. We'll hear more about the, the Fifeville Trail during our, our panel. Um, were there any other sort of collective triumphs or um, things that folks have seen? I, I think one other that, that we'll share, and then we'll move to our, our, our panel, um, that, that I thought was great was last summer when the um, Charlottesville City Schools realized they weren't going to be able to get everybody to school on a bus anymore. Uh, increase the number of kids that were walking and it, it turned out that was already something that Dr. Gurley really um, was in favor of. It's more kids walking. But uh, I think unanimously we'd agree that the um, sidewalks and streets of Charlottesville are not as safe as they ought to be. So the school district approached the Mobility Alliance and asked how, how we could help get something going quickly. And um, so there were a couple of ways that uh, different groups helped out. Uh, number one is recruited a whole bunch of crossing guards, which, you know, hopefully the crossing guards are a thing that'll stay. That, that should have always been like that. Um, of course, we know infrastructure takes a long time to develop, but um, certain quick fixes were, um, designed and put into place in a matter of weeks rather than in a matter of years. And the Fifield Trail also is an example of a, a safer route to school. And um, a, a lot more kids walk into to school and we know that that, you know, 60 minutes a day of, of walking to school and being out. And, and by the way, let's not um, either uh, forget the contributions of the um, school district teachers and staff who literally still even today are going out into neighborhoods and picking up kids. So. And UVA students who wake up early and go walk from Friendship Court to Clark. So, yeah. So um, the waking up early thing for the UVA students is especially good. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a first year, he thinks 11 o'clock is a morning class. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm ready for bed at 11. Uh, not today though, because um, um, we're having a great uh, time. So, so um, any other um, uh, ideas or times to share? Well, um, 
we could uh, move on to the next item on the agenda, which is our panel. That's scheduled for 1045. Would you all like a quick bio break in between? Like, what do you think, Selena? Should we just declare a five minute break and? A stretch break. Stretch break, yeah. Bio means all kinds of things. It might just mean a deep breath. It might mean like, I'm running out of here. This summit sucks way more than I thought it would. And I need a discreet access. I'm going to do that. Um, but grab some drinks. Bathroom's right over here. We'll begin our summit at all. You want to plug in the plug
me. I'm trying to project my voice, but it sounds like it's coming back on me. So if you can't hear me, just kind of raise your hand. Um, but I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists. I have just a couple of questions that I'm going to ask them all to respond to. And if you have questions that you'd like to ask, if you'd like to take the three by five cards that are on your desk and write them down and get Peter's attention, Peter will come and get them from you or you can pass them to the side and Peter will get them. And, um, and then we'll have a chance for you all to ask questions. And so we just kind of want it to be um, a conversation, an opportunity to hear from folks who are, are doing great things in our community and, and learn from each other. So I'll introduce our panelists. Um, right here to my right is Carmelita Wood, who is with the Fifeville Neighborhood Association. And, and Peter just briefly talked about the Fifeville Neighborhood Association. Um, and they show how a community can seize control of its future through smart planning, active community outreach, and on the ground sweat equity. So we'll hear more about that, um, the story of how they came to be and what they're up to. Um, next, we have Robert Gray, who is with the Uhuru Foundation. And the foundation works with at-risk youth and adults to foster upward mobility and healthy lifestyles. Their peace in the streets efforts are about interrupting the cycle of gun-related hostilities. And we have Will Jones with the Prolific Run Crew. Prolific is changing what it means to be a runner or a walker and redefining who owns the streets. They are about empowering people through mutual encouragement and a mindset of abundance. So these are, that's just a, a brief capture of the work that um, is happening here around our city. So the first question that, that I have for each of you and you all can take it wherever you wanna go with it. But the question really is like, just tell us a, about your organization. Give us the origin story and maybe the reason that it exists. So Carmelita, why don't we start with you? Um, I'm with the um, Fight Field Neighborhood Association. Um, we've been in existence for years. I want to say maybe 50, 60 years. Um, there have been previous presidents um, that have been with the association. Um, just having the neighborhood come together and, and give them um, knowledge of what's going on in the neighborhood um, and having our meetings and whatever concerns that the residents have, taking it to the appropriate entities that that are involved around the neighborhood. Um, one of the major things that we've been talking about uh, is what we wanna see and what residents wanna see in the neighborhood um, and how the, the neighborhood association can, can um, bring in certain groups to help the neighbors in the neighborhood. Uh, AHIP, um, Abundant Life Ministries in the neighborhood and the mosque, boys and girls clubs, all of those. So we go to the different um, outside areas and those people to talk to them about what the neighborhood is all about and how they can help us and how we can help them. Um, the mosque is the Islamic mosque in the neighborhood who we partnered with um, we can go and use their facility. Um, they bring whatever concerns they have for their residents, for the Islamic residents in the neighborhood to us. And, and we just talk to each other and, and just work together to um, help them feel comfortable in our neighborhood and also to help us feel comfortable with them in our neighborhood. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Rob Gray, co-founder, executive director of the Uhuru Foundation. Uh, we were founded back in 2019. <clears throat> it just started off as, uh, so me and my partner, we grew up together. We took a class, uh, the CIC, and we actually like took the class for like to, to help out with like a for-profit business. Uh, for-profit for business we wanted to start, um, but that ended up turning into a nonprofit where we went out um, into the community, basically working with a uh, moderate to like high risk youth, teaching uh, social entrepreneurship, which is basically helping them identify a problem they might see um, in their community, in their neighborhood and creating like a business model around that problem um, to solve that problem. That kind of like morphed into um, more of a mentoring program where we provide like credible messenger mentoring uh, which is basically using individuals who uh, are native, 
native to like some of the neighborhoods we work in um, to basically provide mentorship to a lot of the youth we work with since they are like moderate to high risk. Um, so we go inside like detention centers. Um, we also go inside like alternative schools. Um, we run a program called the Healthy, Wealthy and Wise in which, in which we touch on like just basic overall better decision making. So just teaching youth how to make uh, better decisions. We touch on like identity and purpose, um, and some trauma and pain, you know, identifying triggers, how to work through those triggers um, to make better decisions. And then we also include like financial literacy. Um, and so, yeah, that's just like the basis of our organization and, and the purpose of why we started. Uh, my name is Will Jones. Um, I'm originally from Atlantic City, Pleasantville, New Jersey. Uh, I came to Charlottesville in 2006. I'm saying all of that because like the reason that Prolific started has a lot to do with just not being from here. Um, <clears throat> the neighborhoods that our route goes through are neighborhoods that if I would have been born in Charlottesville, I would have probably lived in or lived right outside of. Um, and so when I came here and started working, I'm a barber. Um, I've been cutting hair since I was 17 years old. Um, so that's really all that I've ever done as a profession. When I came here in 06, I was on Cherry Avenue cutting hair. Um, when I opened my own barbershop, I opened up on 29 in like the end of 2008. And so it took me out of the community in the way that I was positioned originally. Um, and so because of that, I started running this route that connected um, 6th Street, um, Garrett Square, West Haven, or the projects, um, Prospect and Orangedale. I just connected those routes together. And I started at the church um, on 1st Street because I had gotten married there um in 2006 so it was a familiar place where I could go park my car and just run those neighborhoods with my dog um and my purpose was just to be seen and to see my people because all of the I ever seen running in Charlottesville was white people um and so on purpose I wanted to run and show my people that we could take care of ourselves in this way and so I just started doing that um, over the years, many years went by and then eventually I started inviting maybe like 2016 or so. I started running that route, route like 2010, 2011, maybe 2016, I started inviting fellas out from the barbershop to run the route with me. Um, eventually one of my good brothers, Wes Bellamy ran the route with me. Um, and then we just started catching on a little bit of steam, just inviting brothers out to run. And so it was just a small group of us and then COVID hit. Um, and when COVID hit and George Floyd's murder happened, um, a lot of people just didn't know what to do with their energy, I think. Um, a lot of people were unsettled with the injustices going on in the country. Um, a lot of people were stuck in the house from COVID. And so it was kind of like prescribed to us to get outside and move. And so I think we just became like this safe space for people to come to um, and, and feel like they were being involved in something that was like for the community, that was mindful of the Black community, that was led by Black people. Um, and so what, what I started was just running. I really just started running this route. And that over time, just my creative mind and my entrepreneurial spirit, we just evolved into naming the Run Crew Prolific, which was a brand name that we had already created because we wanted to start some street clothes and stuff. Um, so we just named the Run Crew after Prolific. And because the Run Crew was doing the type of work that we wanted the brand to do anyway, it just made sense. Um, and so we were in the community, we were involved with the people in the community, we had moved people out of their homes that lived in, um, in West Haven into their new home. So we were just doing stuff in the community that was the type of work that we wanted prolific to really um, do. And so we named the Run Crew that. And, and now the Run Crew has evolved in, and the, the whole brand has evolved into this um, this opportunity to really introduce 
this sport a run to the black community, which is very powerful. It's a really good healing space. It's a um it's meant for a lot of good mental um and emotional um kind of intelligence development in Charlottesville amongst not just youth, but also our adults. You know, it's it's been a space where a lot of people haven't been able to have fun in their life because they have started working and they become adults and they take care of children and all of this stuff. And so this run crew has kind of became a space where people used to do something that was very solitary and now they're able to do it and it feels like a team kind of environment. And so it's this camaraderie that was lost because you're not in the high school locker rooms anymore. You're not, you're just not a kid. And I think a lot of people were able to experience that from our run crew. And it gave a lot of, um, I think, life back to the city and, and the individuals who are participating. And then I think the individuals who have experienced our wave kind of move through the city have um, been encouraged by the sort of energy and the, the encouragement that we bring. Um, and we just hope that that sort of, that model is something that our communities really take on. Like we end this race together. We don't have to compete with each other, but it's something that we can we can cooperatively compete. Like his success can just make me better. And so that's something that we try to live out in the run. Um, yeah, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> Um, I love what you're saying about how, you know, your success is my success and how we build off each other. Um, and you kind of already answered this, Will, in terms of like your why. Um, but when you think about other people who are involved, like are, what are some of the whys that people come and run with you and engage in for Um... What I've heard, some, some of it is just <clears throat> wanting to run and not feeling safe doing it alone, um, specifically for women a lot of the time. At that time in the morning, they couldn't do that by themselves. Um, for, for guys, specifically Black men, it just wasn't something that they ever tried. It wasn't something that was cool to do. And so it it has restricted them. So coming out and seeing a group of people doing it made it attractive for them. Um, I can speak for Littles. Like now he sees after running that route the first time, he, he would say that, you know, this was, this was an opportunity for me to be able to go into communities that I wouldn't normally go into after certain hours. Um, because we started running that route on like Friday nights at nine, 10 o'clock at night. And so it was on purpose to see the homies outside drinking, smoking, and just speak to them and keep moving. So he was able to do that in neighborhoods that he wouldn't go into at those times of night. And so it allowed him to start forming relationships with those people and not being so against each other just by practice, just by not being living in that space. That's a couple, I think. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, Rob, what's kind of your why? Man, my why is uh, <clears throat> love. Honestly, like, you know, we walk, you know, we walk, walk outside into our communities, like, just like a bunch of broken people, broken spirits. And so, like, a lot of the youth I work with, they come from, you know, you know, uh, you know, single parent home where, you know, dad might not be around. Um, family is just broken. Like just the family structure, family unit is broken. And um, for me, like, I just want to offer love, you know, redemption um, and hope. And just like being able to, you know, um, you know, exert that type of energy, you know, with, with the individuals that I work with. And, um, you know, we recently had like two kids basically get accepted to Virginia State University. Um, the one kid, Noah, we started running our program while he was like incarcerated at Blue Ridge. And um, people had written them off. And a lot of kids we work with, like people write them off. A lot of the men, uh, specifically black men that we work with, people have written them off. And so um, when you go in and just like, I just try to love on them and, and, and bring them back to life because um, you know, we are humans. And so 
um, just being able to, you know, support them in that type of way where, you know, they have, they know they have someone in their corner who cares about them. And uh, I'm able to, you know, just be my authentic self, you know, come in, tattooed up, braids, you know, I'm pretty, I think I dress nice, I look nice. Um, and just being able to have like real conversations with people and, um, and heal them. Like, I, I feel like it's power in the tongue, it's power in words. And so, you know, I'm not always going in and, and, and preaching to um, to these individuals. We're just like, just fellowship. And I, I feel like it's a fellowship. And uh, like Will said, it's a safe space where you're you're allowed to, to be yourself and you're allowed to, you know, talk about stuff that you normally wouldn't talk about with, you know, with your parents or um, strangers. And so I think, for me, my why is love. Um, I think about the community that I came from. I come from Esmont. I don't know if y'all are familiar with the area, but we call it the Africa album. <laughs> and um, very tight knit, close community, um, but it's a poor working class community. And so, you know, I saw a lot of um, drug abuse, you know, from, from neighbors and stuff like that in my community. And, um, <clears throat> I will always think like, like growing up, like, like, damn, like, you know, how did, you know, how did these individuals get like this? You know, how did they get, like, how did they get to this point? And then, you know, as I, you know, <clears throat> grew older, I realized it was, you know, structural, it's systemic. Like, so we just need better outlets. We need more opportunities. Like we have geniuses that live in these communities that can add to, you know, add on to this world. And, um, their assets to this world. They can help change the world, make the world a better place with their ideas. It's a lot of times they just don't have access to the same opportunities um, as some of our counterparts. And so um, I'm just here, you know, to support in that way and provide love, again, love and, you know, kind of like, you know, bring people together. I, I, I look at myself as a connector, right? I can come in this room and speak and, um, connect with individuals and, and form fr friendships, but I can also go back, go back into our communities and, and, and make that connection and help build a bridge. So, thank you. You're welcome. From the leader. Um, <clears throat> number of things. Um, community building um, and also uh, help. Um, when we started, uh, the one of the things we started and got together was the Fifield Neighborhood Trail. Um, we went out to the Boys and Girls Club, um, to the principals and teachers at the schools, um, to the property owner, um, and we brought all these people into a room together and say, what can a neighborhood association do and how can we give back to this community? Um, a lot of things that we heard from students and teachers and principals was the kids didn't feel safe walking to and from areas and accessing this, this place of Cherry Avenue um, safely. Um, the streets are narrow, the traffic is heavy. Um, so what can we do? There's a property owner in the neighborhood, I mean, in the, in the room that has land, a lot of land. Um, and Tonsler Park, the parents want the kids to get to Tonsler Park safely, not riding the bicycles down these busy streets and getting hit. So the property owner, we talked to him and it's like, we'd like to build this trail on your property. Is this possible? Um, and he wanted to give back also. Um, so he allowed us to go in there, this wooded area behind um, Greenstone on Fifth and between Fifth Street. Um, and get in there and pull up the weeds and dig up the trees along with the city's help. So of course, they had to bring in the bulldozers and all that stuff um, and build this trail on his property. Um, this trail has access three different ways off of Fifth Street, um, off of Greenstone on Fifth, off of Seven and a Half Street. Oh, and one more off of Cherry Avenue. So you can go in the back of Tosla Park and you've got this land here like this, and there's a trail, there's a stream. Um, children have used it for science projects to go on there and, and find all kinds of leaves and animals and things. And you have people walking their dog, connecting with each other, 
that they see on this trail. Um, Tonsta Park and the city have opened up the fence behind the park to give better access to these communities and Cherry Avenue. Um, people walking to work or biking. Also, you walk. The mosque has come into the room and they build a bench. You can just sit there by the stream. So um, we, we've we opened up all this access to all these different um, areas of the community and people see their neighbors and people come through there and say, oh, this is great. I don't have to go all the way around. My kid can go straight to Tosta Park from this trail and don't have to be on this busy highway um, or this busy street. Children walking to school now use this path to get to beautiful school from other areas of the city and community. So we, we, we wanted to build a safe route um, for, for these um, residents and we feel pretty good about it. <laughs> We've given you access to nature. We've given you access to different um, communities and connecting to different areas of the city without having to be out on this. It's a beautiful piece of property. You all ought to walk that trail. <laughs> it's really, really nice. Um, the, the owner of the property is really involved in helping us keep this going. I think, I think it's amazing, you know, just all the people that you brought together to, um, to get this accomplished. And it's a great service to the community. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, you're talking about the, the trail system and just how people are connecting on the trail. And this question is, is for the three of you to, to kind of think about how, um, you know, exercise, fresh air and access to outdoor spaces is important to the work that you do and your larger goals in general. So we have gotten, um, I, years ago, this trail, it wasn't really a trail. It was just a path people used to get to wherever they had to go over them. Um, I'm going to say this because this is one of the reasons why we felt it was important to open this back up. Um, I guess it was in the late 70s. There was a gentleman who was killed on that property, um, drug related. Um, so the city closed that part of the, the, the path off. Um, and for years, it was just growing up stuff. So we went to actually went to the sister of the guy that was killed and asked her how she felt about this being opened back up again. And she was very excited. She said, I think we should. And so from there, we got her consent. We felt it was we needed to do that because she still lives in Greenstone up there. And we didn't want to have, you know, people walking in and out. And just we just wanted to know how she felt about it. She was very excited that we were going through that and going to do that. Um, and the people that we see, we've seen some city officials walking the trail. And one guy was like, every time we come to the park, my daughter says we've got to go to the trail. Um, Abundant Life Ministries has different programs, and they've sent us emails and pictures of the kids actually on that trail, picking up the leaves and look, you know, identifying the different leaves and the different animals, the bugs and things. We've seen box trails on, uh, box tracks on the trail. So they're excited to learn about it. Um, they're excited to just be there. It's, it's a peace, calming sense, you know, they say when they're there. Um, people walk their dogs on the trail and they are like, it's so easy to come off of Cherry Avenue and be able to get to my house quickly, you know, timely. Um, I can walk to work and I don't have to worry about, you know, I can park my car and walk to work and, and, and just the nature of it. Um, they're excited people. We really like seeing people being excited about this trail. And so many people, sometimes I can be, in a store or something and somebody will speak to me and say, oh yeah, and I walked the trail the other day. It's probably nice. So, I mean, just knowing that we created this for people to be out there and to enjoy, um, it's awesome. We do, we've even had some residents um, say, I'm willing to, you know, whack weed or something, you know, if you need it, just call me. So people are excited to help keep it up. Keep it up. Um, that's really nice. I mean, I just think it's important just to be connected, you know, 
to obviously like groups like Prolific uh, and other, you know, biking groups in the community, uh, especially like just for the African-American community. You don't really see it. I don't really see a lot of like, you know, black people on bikes or black people running. And so I think um, it's therapeutic. Uh, it's definitely an outlet. I know like, so we, uh, like she said, we run a circle, a peace circle through our Peace in the Streets program. And um, one of the things that came up with some of the guys who, uh, who, who participated in that program, they were just saying like, we don't have access to like a gym, like everything's so expensive around here. Like we wanna be able to like, you know, work out and, and just do something therapeutic outside of just sitting in our house. And so um, that kind of like prompted me to, uh, we partnered with uh, Community Bikes to, to do the, um, to do the uh, bike ride, the, the, the unity and the Community Bike Ride. And the goal of that was just to get, you know, people on bikes and also just bring people together to help um, heal the community. Uh, we've been dealing with like a lot of gun violence, as y'all know. And so um, I feel like, you know, that was a good time to kind of like get people together and uh, fellowship and heal in that way. And it's also, it, it also served as like a therapeutic outlet for, um, for folks to kind of like uh, just be connected in a different type of way outside of their day to day. Uh, I mean, you know, I think we all saying the same thing in a lot of ways. I guess what I would just say in my own words is, um, you know, movement is really important to people, to humans. Um, you know, they say the body keeps the score. And so, you know, when you, when you grow up and you had a lot of trauma in your life and you know, you're not using your body the way it was intended to be used because now you're working and you don't really get to exercise. And, you know, these these things, we kind of, I think society sees them as luxuries, but exercise is like a, it should be a mandate. It should be something that we have to do um, because our bodies hold stuff. And if we don't exercise it out, you know, then you're holding stuff. <laughs> and so, for me, as far as running goes, you know, this is our first mode of transportation is our, is our feet, is our legs. Um, and so to reconnect people to something that, you know, the most high, the creator, whatever you want to go by, you know, that's what they gave you to travel. You know, this is our first mode of transportation. And so when we're not connected with that, then I don't believe that we really are using our bodies the way they were intended. And so that that gives us all types of issues, like in our minds and every, like we are, our bodies are very well made machines. And so certain things that we do and need to do are, are health, healthy for us. And so I think being able to get outside and run, being able to get on a trail, being able to walk through a trail and feel safe, um, being able to have groups that you can work out with, we thought it was important to keep everything free because, you know, stuff is expensive in this city. And so to be able to get together and just run and there's no membership fees, there's no, you know, there's no expected fee to, to be able to have a community to work out with, I thought, and we think is important for um, people who have challenges and see something like running as a luxury, you know, like, there is a, that people look out into the world in our community and they see when you are running, like you have time to do that. And that is a luxury. And the, and the reality is that is true, but it shouldn't be a luxury. Like I don't run because I have the luxury to run. I run because I need to run because it helps me to like stay balanced. It helps me to stay healthy in a way that allows me to be confident in this world where there's a lot of danger around. And we all need that sort of safety and confidence. And so if we can inspire people to do something routinely that like back door, you running, you just getting up and running four miles three times a week, but in the back door, it's like you doing something hard three times a week. And over time, you start to understand I could do hard stuff. Like I can believe in myself in ways that people taught me not to. 
And so that means a lot to our community, to these young men that he's servicing, to these people who are taking advantage of her trail, who are suffering from this gun violence all around them. It's like, how can I get free from this? And so being able to get outside and move your body is just one of the very um, inexpensive ways that you can you know, escape some of that stuff. So, thank you. So, um, hey, Wyatt, would you mind bringing up a, a seltzer for everybody on the stage, please? Yeah. Thank you. So, anybody have questions? If you folks have submitted questions. Okay, so we, we had one question that was um, specific to one of the panelists, but I think it's like actually an excellent question for all three panelists. Is um, uh, I would imagine that each of you hear some version of discouragement from an onlooker saying you're taking people into something that's not safe, right? Like whether like uh, running that that's crazy, they might get hit by a car, or that neighborhood's the wrong kind of neighborhood, or or that that trail. Don't you know somebody got killed back there in the day? Um, I'd be interested to, to, we don't dwell on the naysayers, but, but what are some of your um, thoughts and sort of answers to, um, to, to, to that question like about whether you're taking someone into something not safe? Uh, on the trail. On the trail, we've had um, consultants with police officers. Um, we've had consultants with um, Peter about the lighting on the trail. We've got, I don't know, if we, um, what type of lighting we can use on the trail. Um, we've come up with solar lighting, um, but you know, it's come on at night um, and how much um, that um, the policeman has given us some different options about safety. Um, we also have someone that not working that walks the trail <laughs> quite often um, to it's to see if there's anything going on or to see if there's an issue with the trail, and he brings it back to us so that we can try to address it. Um, also, um, as far as the safety, everybody says they feel pretty safe on that trail. Um, Greenstone on 5th, which is the apartment complex right behind uh, on the other side of the trail. Oh my God, they have so much lighting on that building. It lights up this room, just like this room's light up. So <laughs> probably not gonna be an issue as far as that's concerned. Um, also on Greenstone on 5th, there were some issues about trespassing coming on their property. Um, from the trail. Well, the, the managers there said they don't have an issue with that. They have cameras pointed. Um, they also said that they could, if we wanted to, they could add additional cameras to point towards the trail. We haven't gotten that far in that yet. Um, we right now don't feel like there's a need for it. Um, at one time when the trail first opened, we noticed that someone had, I guess they were homeless, had set up a camp site on that trail. Um, <clears throat> we got some room, someone from the Haven there to come in and inspect it. And apparently that person probably had gone, but just left the stuff there. So they, they came on and cleaned that site up. So we, we're involved with a lot of people that, to keep watch on that trail and try to identify any major, major um, safety issues and so far thank god we haven't had had a lot um so and, I, and and as far as the gentleman that got killed this was back in the 70s when the drugs first came into the city so there was a lot of um things going on there um and it wasn't really a trail then it was just like people use you know you use a path but someone's backyard it's just a path or wooded area so right now with all the openness of the trail we don't have, thank goodness, that much safety issues. And that was one of the reasons for um, building the trail, safety for the kids and for the community. Um, 
Um, as it relates to prolific, I think, um, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I think makes it fun is the, the low key danger and running through the streets. Um, but we run on sidewalks, you know, it's sidewalks all through the city, it's crosswalks now. One of the triumphs is that, you know, they put the crosswalk on Fifth Street, I think had a lot to do with us crossing that street in the morning as, you know, as often as we did. Um, as far as danger in the communities goes, you know, that's a perception thing. I don't, I don't think that that danger is real as far as, I think I wouldn't run, I wouldn't run through those communities at 10 o'clock at night with the crowd of people that we are running through at six o'clock in the morning, um, just because I wouldn't want to rub people the wrong way, not because it's dangerous, um, not because those people would now try to do something to us because we're running through there. But I just, you know, I, I think any community that you go into, you need to be respectful. And so I kind of model respect. And so I expect the people that are running with us to have the same sort of respect. And so to not expect for there to be danger keeps it from being danger. Like a lot of fear causes stuff to happen. And so I think that we go through these places with respect. We run through Main Street with respect. Like we speak to people, like we not, we're not moving through the space with this sort of arrogance that causes people to be off put by us. And so I think that changes the dynamic and there's no need to be like concerned about safety. Now, cars and stuff is a thing. And you know, this is something that we need to also learn, like is to be watchful as people and to pay attention to our surroundings and to watch out for each other. And so that's something that we try to try to do. We call out cars, you know, we try to hold traffic if we can, or we hold our people if we need to. So, you know, we practice community in that way. So it's a real, it's a real practice. I mean, you can't, you can't be better at stuff without practicing and everything ain't going to be safe in life. So I don't really care what they say, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really think that question applies to, you know, the type of work that I do, so mm -hmm. I'll pass. Okay, yeah. Um, so, uh, Selena, there were a whole bunch of questions that were a version of the next one that we talked about you asking. Um, I'm gonna, I guess, ask a, um, a, another one is, uh, so there's a number of you have talked about things that are, impossible for one person, but, or seem impossible for one person, but become possible when you, when you have a collective. And, um, you know, building on, on uh, what you're talking about, Will, I've met a lot of runners that, um, they're, they're awesome, like fast runners, and yet they won't come out of the gym <clears throat> because it doesn't feel safe, but if they have a, a little group, they're, they're the most expressed runners out there. Um, uh, so, so that's like on the participation side, but you all each also work with the team as well. So it, is there like, uh, could you talk about like, um, we'll start with you, Will, and it applies to each of you. Um, the, the fact that, that you've got, you know, um, a couple of other people working with you by your side that makes it easier for, for you to keep going with it. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, this is definitely not me by myself. I'm, I'm, I'm not that good at all of this stuff. Um, like I said, I've been a barber for 20 plus years now. Um, so certain things that... <laughs> I just don't even want to do. And so I see the need for team and we wouldn't, Prolific wouldn't be as well put together as it is if we didn't have other personalities, other strong contributors that really help um, to pay attention to everything that's going on around us. Um, so yeah, I, again, it's just like community. You can't, you really can't do anything in this life without having some people to work with. And you know, you 
you could be, it's just like sports. I mean, you could be LeBron James, but man, you really need some strong people around you that can help you carry out the mission. And so I believe that we have a strong team. Um, and, and Charlottesville has been very helpful and, and cooperative with um, just people coming together organically and playing a part and and helping us. Because again, all of our stuff has been organic. There was no mission to like grow some social enterprise. Like that wasn't a mission, but we just are creative. And so we see an opportunity and we really are, this is who we are. So we have used the team and organic placement of people in, from the community to really grow this thing. But I think that's what we all have to do to grow something special and to be able to impact the community, you gotta be a community. Cause that's what people really wanna see is community. And if you aren't living it, then how are you going to like help people to grow theirs? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Same here, like, you know, I play sports my whole life, um, basketball, football, baseball. And so I understand the importance of team and working, you know, in collaboration with, with other individuals um, for a collective goal. And uh, I just look at it like, you know, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And so when we, we put together our organization, uh, I was very, very um, critical about incorporating the community. And when I say the community, I'm talking about like the people who, you know, other individuals might have written off. And so when I say like credible messenger mentoring, I want to be clear, like a lot of the individuals on my staff who work my team are formerly incarcerated. And so who else better to relate to a lot of these youth who are currently going through something that they've already been through? Like, and so like just the relationship building piece, like, you know, I don't have to, you know, second guess, like, you know, what you've been through because you know, you've, you've pretty much um, written a book I'm currently reading. And so a lot of the youth, they they pay attention to stuff like that. They, they'll often ask like, hey, like, you know, what have you been through? And if you haven't really been through anything, they don't wanna really listen to you. Um, and so me, I'm blessed to, you know, not being, you know, not have ever been incarcerated, but I grew up around it, like my family members, um, you know, so I'm able to relate in a different type of way. And I, I think it's important when we talk about community and, and team building that we we uh, we include the individuals who we might not necessarily think are you know valuable, but they I think for me you know through my experience they sometimes are some of the most valuable assets to building a team and uh, and helping out the community. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have so many team members, I can't even name them. <laughs> um, first, we had to get the property owner. What are the properties? Which they own all of that property. Um, we had Rabana Trails. We had the city. We had Parks and Rec. We had the Boys and Girls Club. Abundant Life, the mosque. Um, Piedmont Environmental Council. Peter helped me because there was some more I can't. Uh, we just brought this group of people together. Um, and say, this is what we want to do. And we went uh, visit and talk to kids in summer camps, the principals of, of Johnson, Jackson Byer, and Charlottesville High. Um, just going out, talking to different summer camps, had the kids involved. They um, made a list of names they wanted to call the trail. They they drew pictures of what they wanted to see on the trail. Some of the kid wanted a restaurant on the trail. <laughs> um, they wanted to see, they, they wanted to draw pictures. I think we walked, were you with us when we walked the trail and someone had drew the pictures and hung on the trees? Mm -hmm. This is our trail. Um, uh, Tinkerbell, uh, it was really nice. Um, so we wanted to get everybody involved and, and find out what they wanted on this trail and what they wanted to see on this trail, just to make it feel like it was theirs. You know, this is this is our community. This is your trail. You know, um, so we had so many people involved, and I can't think of the guy from UVA because there was some legal stuff going on. 
um, you know, saying that we are not responsible. I mean, saying that the property owner is not responsible for anything that happens on this trail. So we had to get all that legal stuff worked out. Um, but it wasn't dismissed. Um, so we, we just had a lot of people in the room to get to get it going. And, and, and of course, the Neighborhood Association, we couldn't do it by ourselves. So it was great. Awesome. Um, so um, maybe before our outro question, I'll ask one more that, that's good from the audience is, so I, I say this all the time, but it, it's serious. Like it's not Charlottesville and it's not Albemarle. It's like this, this place, like Charlottesville, Albemarle, you don't know whether you're in the one or the other at any given time. And our infrastructure often stops at the city line or the county line. Um, I, I wanted to um, uh, start this question with, with Rob as someone who, who grew up in Esmond and um, uh, about how to, um, to uh, make the sort of community resources that are um, more easily accessible when you think about it at the city. Um, applicable to folks who live in the rural parts of the county. And then, uh, Will, I believe you actually live in, in the county. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thinking about like how we as a collective can do better at providing these types of outdoor recreation resources to folks that don't live, you know, just a stone's throw from Tonsler Park. Right? you know, within a community that's got a playground or even a track within walking distance. Uh, why don't you go ahead and start? I was just saying, like, I would just say, like, just be more intentional. Like, you know, Albemarle County is bigger than, you know, what you see on Route 29 Mall. Like, it's, it's huge. Um, and so just be more intentional. Like, you know, there are individuals who, like, live in food deserts who don't really have or aren't in like close proximity to like good grocery stores healthy grocery stores and uh so just be more intentional like i, I feel like we need to build build in those areas as well and um you know provide resources to those individuals who live in those communities uh, the same way we provide you know resources to individuals who live in a city what is the question that you're asking me so so question is um uh, how how can we make sure that, that folks who live in Albemarle County, particularly now the more urban parts of Albemarle County, uh, have access to parks and easy access to recreation? Because it, it might seem like you're living in a, a green environment, but yet it's not easy to find a place to go for a run or a walk or whatever in the neighborhood. Yeah. I don't have the answer to that myself, and I don't. I don't like to try to act like I do. I, we got to plan better. We got to. Somebody has to put some plans, and you know, I guess the people have to demand for the need for it. But I run. I run in the county a lot because even though I run that route in the city, I've always kind of run in the county as well because that's where I've always lived, um, and it's not the easiest. It's not the easiest to like where I live now out near Barracks West to run to YMCA from there. You know, you got to you got to do a whole lot of maneuvering to cross some major roads and stuff. So I think that um, some stuff can't be fixed. Like it's a big it's a big area. Like how you going to make traveling space for us. So I don't really know the answer. That's not my, that's not my thing. I think that we really gotta, I think one, we gotta be using the space for people to see the need. Like if people use it, then somebody gotta do something. But if we ain't really using it, you can't put pressure on somebody to do something that is not being demanded. So um, I think that's kind of how the Fifth Street thing got put up. A whole lot of other people in this room may have been making noise about doing something like that. But I know we didn't ask for it. We just were doing what we do and somebody saw the need for it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying that always happens, but what I do believe is if you do something and you do it enough, you're gonna make somebody have to do something. Mm 
<laughs> and if that means that we need some trails out there, yep. if somebody starts doing something and, and using the space and somebody starts complaining enough, then somebody going to have to do something. And if it's going to mean somebody going to have to put some money up in the county to start building this stuff that's needed. I don't have any other answer though than that. I think that's a very well qualified answer, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Kermit Lita, any any thoughts about the um, the community outside of Fightville and being more connected? Just, um, communication, word of mouth. Um, just take it to your officials or whatever, and try to rally people around you that they can help get that word out. Yeah. Um, Thanks. Uh, there were a lot of questions that, that get to this question of like what types of collaborations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, well, thank you all for um, offering your questions. And this this is our, our kind of final question for you all to think about in terms of um, you all have all talked about how you know you don't do this work alone. And this um, this question is really about. What do you see in the future in terms of what kind of collaborations might be of interest to you in the future to um, you know, just keep doing what you're doing or do something new or you know, who, who would you like to work with? What might that look like? Uh, yeah, I'll go first. Um, so <laughs> our organization, we have a, a partnership with Habitat for Humanity and basically through that partnership, we're gonna provide housing um, for individuals either facing homelessness currently in the community or just returning citizens, returning back to the community, trying to uh, reintegrate back into society. And so as a part of that partnership, um, I definitely want to connect with uh, the running community, prolific, and then also uh, potentially the biking community just to you know, provide a therapeutic outlet for uh, some of the individuals who live in, in that house. So. Um, <clears throat> I'm immediately piggybacking off of what Burke said, we have been trying to organize some sort of um, bike experience that is relative to the run experience. We even encourage people to come out on their bikes now and, and ride the route with us. Um, but we would like to do something more, a little more intentional where we encourage, you know, people to get out on their bikes in the communities, maybe more in the evening time, um, like in the afternoon time. Um, but that's something that we are looking to do. Um, and we're just looking to do more work personally, just getting in front of children. Um, we started working with the UVA Equity Center. Um, they have a Star Hill Pathway camp that they do. And the children, when they're out of school, they come to this Star Hill Pathway camp and Prolific has started running programming with them. Um, just seeing, you know, what we think we need in our community is just opportunities to model in front of children, like to just show children, just a parent, you know what I mean? Like, that's what I believe we, in order to fix a lot of our situations, we really just need to have to, we have to have the time to spend with the youth. And so um, we're looking to partner with opportunities to get in front of children who really need real people who are going to see them and um, and um, value what they are, like as, as expressive as they are, like you loud, that's fine. We can figure that out. So just being able to be real with our children and, you know, I don't have a teacher's um, certificate or I don't have any of those things. So we just see this as an opportunity to be able to find a way to get into these children's lives and then not be through academics or but this is they need the experience with people. And so, you know, we're looking for opportunities to be able to make that happen. Uh, we have um, a property owner that's recently acquired some property on, on in our neighborhood. Um, and we're working with him to try to get some type of food <coughs> access in the community so people won't have to worry about catching a bus to food line or wagons and waiting an hour to get back home. Um, we've we partnered with them to talk about that. 
Um, also, we partnered with UVA to talk about getting some type of health care, um, just satellite clinics in, in the neighborhood for people that can't afford to get to, to the hospital or have doctors just to get um, some things going with health clinics in the neighborhood. We've done some things over the summer, like doing sports physicals. Um, now we're working with UVA to do like mammogram pop-up um, events and stuff like that. Um, working with um, the local food hub and the co-ops to get some type of fresh food market in the neighborhood. Um, and in that property that the owner has acquired to talk to him about um, doing some type of food access in that property for the community um, to make it easy, accessible to, to, the, to the residents in the neighborhood. From Cherry Avenue, you get your food on Cherry Avenue, you can walk the path and go, go back home. Um, that's easy access. You don't have to drive your car. Um, we're also looking to partner with future development on Cherry Avenue in the neighborhood to, to, to see what they can bring to the neighborhood that the community wants to see in, in the, in the um, community. Um, so we're, we've got a lot going on and, and just hearing what the community has to seeing what the community wants and trying to bring it in, in, in there so that we don't have to be spread all out over the place. We have everything right there in that community. We have access to um, trail walks. We have access to food. We have access to um, clinics coming in, um, just doing things in the community for, just to help people out and, and just make them feel like this is home to them and this is what, you know, just giving you what you want. And, Make it feel like a whole town in one little community. You know, you've got everything here that you need. Um, and just getting it out there. <laughs> also wanted to add, um, so we also want to continue to do like some of the um, unity and the community bike rides as well. So um, that was a partnership we have with community bikes. So we want to, you know, basically continue to do that. Um, I don't know whether, you know, that's monthly or, you know, bi-monthly or whatever, but um, definitely want to continue to do that as well. Can I have a quick follow-up question for that? Yeah, Sorry. sure. So one issue we find there that we're, we always try to wrap our head around is like with running, you show up and you, you've got shoes on your feet and you run. Right. <clears throat> like how do we solve the issue of people getting their bike to a, the start of a, a unity ride like that or keeping their bikes maintained or storing their bikes like that's that's where it always gets stuck you don't have to have the answer for it but it's like <laughs> we would like it like i think a lot of people in this room would like for that to happen like on a monthly basis or weekly basis or like join prolific and do it all the time but there's this huge barrier when it comes to biking mm -hmm. that to we don't want to it, it becomes a privilege thing sometimes for the people who can who have a place to store their bike inside or you know Maybe there's a storage. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe there's a storage or something where like bikes are already at one location when people show up. I mean, the, um, the ride in the fall, there were bikes for everybody. We had more like we were wondering what was going to happen with the, like 20 bikes that we didn't even need while we were out on the ride. So, I mean, I, I do think that it's good to identify the questions. That's clearly one that needs to be um, addressed. There was one other like obvious question that we forgot to ask and forgive me for, for not remembering to ask this, but one by one, tell us what's the most easy way for somebody to find out about you know, what you're up to, whether that's a, a website or Facebook group, they've all got their notebooks and already done. <laughs> at Fifield Neighborhood Association um, at gmail.com. Um, we also have a Facebook page um, and we're also on Nextdoor. We're on Instagram at the Yuhuru, or Yuhuru Foundation VA. Um, Uhuru, U H U R U. Get asked that question a lot. How do you pronounce it? How do you spell it? It means freedom in Swahili. Um, we're on Facebook, the Uhuru Foundation, and then also the Peace in the Streets program, Peace in the Streets. Peace in the Streets on Facebook. Um, we are www.prolific.com. Prolific is spelled P R O L Y. 
F Y C K. Um, we're on Instagram as the Prolific Run Crew. Um, two W's on the end. I'm sure it'll populate and show you. Um, Facebook, I think it's the Prolific Run Crew as well. Um, but we usually post if we're doing anything community like. You know, yesterday we did the run for my Aubrey. It was the um, three year death date of when he was killed on his run. So like we did a 2.23 mile run through the city yesterday. And so like something like that, we post on Instagram and, and share on our story um, and on Facebook. And then the, the website has, um, you know, more information about us, more information about like our merchandise and stuff like that. Um, I think it has a link to like a short documentary that we did with Brooks. Um, yeah. Yeah, so um, we brought flyers for the race that's not this weekend, but next weekend. Liberation. Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you just say a quick way, like showing up with your feet and your <laughs> good intentions is, is the best way to get involved. Yeah. That's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. right? Tell them about the event a week from Saturday. Um, so it's it's the Jeff. It's not Prolific's event. We support um, the event, but it's put on by the Jefferson um, African American Heritage Center. It is a liberation run. Um, I think they have shortened it to like a seven mile run. It is an official event now, um, so you can sign up on Run Sign Up and support the event, or you can come out and just donate. Um, but it's a one, I mean, you can walk it, run it, it's Saturday. Um, we are starting at eight o'clock, I believe it is. Um, but the Jefferson put this event, they put this route together to show and, and go through historical um, historical landmarks throughout the city and through up, it was up at UVA as well, um, where our, our ancestors have, grave sites or um, historical landmarks. And so it's a very informative route that has been put together. Um, but the Jefferson School is responsible for it. It's a good it's a good route though. I enjoy it myself. So the flyers on the counter back there, all the details are there, you know, good job of remembering those. I, I mean I think that was awesome. Uh -huh. Yeah. I'm just blown away and I'm just so excited that you all were able to share part of your morning with us and and just the powerful work that you're doing in the community I was just getting goosebumps just listening <laughs> to how the work that you're doing and the ways that you bring yourself to it so thank you for bringing yourselves to us today mm, thanks for having me thank you uh, um, uh, before we go to lunch, we're going to do another thing. That's one of our, our strange but fun traditions here at the Mobility Alliance. Uh, periodically, we um, celebrate in quite informal ways uh, leaders among, you know, among our myths who, who do exemplary work. Um, you know, we talked about the importance of celebrating achievements. It's also important to recognize the achievements of individuals you know, who are, who are involved in the work over the long haul. And um, so uh, it, it's not an annual thing, but periodically, this is like the fifth time we've given out a golden something award. We've given out <laughs> a golden sprocket. We've given out a golden rock going up a hill. We've given out a, a golden boot, that kind of thing. Um, this year, we have... Um, we were wanting to um, give out a golden machete <laughs> to, uh, excuse me, handcrafted. We, uh, we knew that uh, Carmelita already has a machete, so we <laughs> um, so we, we have this small thing, but our crafter, Hannah Pierce, also made a, a golden katana uh, <laughs> for, uh, to recognize Carmelita for, for her great work in the community. Um, <laughs> 
No, no, you want to tell her to shut up. Go for it. Right. So, so she wasn't kidding when we were she was talking about the vegetation that had grown up along the Playful Trail. It was you know, it was thick. It was like Southeast Asia or something. And we showed up there and it was like this wall of, of green. And, but Carmelita had a machete on her and she just started like cutting right through, cutting right through the, the greenery. We were, we were scared, like Kristen Sick was with me and like we we're kind of hiding behind her. You know, she is like working her way through. And, um, the machete is also great because not only is she a literal trailblazer, literally cutting her way through the, the green, but she also cuts through other things with her truth telling and her, uh, you know, ability to get things done. So, so this is, you know, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so. Give a round for Hannah Pierce, who, who fabricated this. Um, yeah. But we needed a machete, and she was right on it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's a little before twelve. We we have a, a lunch break. You want to like send us. On our way. <laughs> I was going to say we never did introductions. Okay, around. We did. We did one around the room and, and said okay. there, there are faces in here I don't know. Well, well but I don't mean to detract. You guys are getting ready to go to something. That sounds perfect. Well, yeah. thank you all for for the yeah, panel. Um, these guys were introduced, but Michael's correct. And actually, we do have a little time on our schedule before lunch. I'm here to so. fill your schedule for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's let's do a quick um, work our way through the um, work our way through the room. You know these four people, and you know me. You want to start us off, Allison? Sure. Um, I'm Allison Rabel. Um, I work for Albemarle County as a community connector um, in the office, or the Communications and Public Engagement Office. Um, I started in November. You may recognize my name if you have read the paper, but now I work for the county. <laughs> Since you're standing up. <laughs> Since you're standing up, I just, you know. Um, Jason Espy. I am a resident of um, Ridge Street. I uh, live close to Tonsler. Um, I love the new trail there. And uh, um, I want to check you guys out, so learn more about Prolific. Um, I am a community planner by trade. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, since I'm doing this, Michael Barnes, I currently work with VDOT trying to help communities develop uh, their applications. We're making a big push right now on, you know, when they come to us for applying for funding, making sure that they've sort of followed all through lots of the planning and planning context, as well as some of the engineering hurdles they might have with projects. Um, but before that, uh, I've been a planner in the community, um, board member of RTF, I lived here about 20 years. I'm Ethan Gruber. I'm the treasurer for the Charlottesville Racing Club, which is the largest bicycle racing club uh, in the city. It's the only one. But we have about um, 100 adult members who race uh, any type of bicycle race, mountain bike, road bike, triathlon. And we also have probably one of, if not the largest youth mountain biking programs in, uh, in Virginia with about 100 uh, middle school age kids who are part of our program. I'm also the organizer for the Charlottesville Bike Fest and Criterium race coming up in April. Uh, my name is Rob McGinnis. Uh, I'm the senior land use field representative covering Albemarle, working with Peter quite a bit. Um, I joined PEC in June, and before that, um, I was in private practice as a landscape architect across the country. Um, J.D. Brown. Um, I'm mostly here as a community member today, but um, also an attorney and planner up at UVA with uh, a, a group called Biophilic Cities. 
I'm Chris Gensick, I'm City of Charlottesville's Parks Greenway Trails Planner. So I do land acquisitions, easement acquisitions, project management, grant writing, volunteer coordination, um, anything and everything we can do to uh, basically connect all of our parks, schools, natural areas, businesses, churches, everything, um, so that people can ride and walk safely, hopefully off road where we can. We're trying to connect those dots that Allie mentioned where you got to get off road. Um, also, one of the founding members of the Three Notch Trail Club, which is now becoming more and more of a thing. I was hoping Jason was going to Hulk, Hulk open his shirt there and show off. Um, you know, it's, which started as an idea to connect to Blue Ridge Tunnel and has now become how to connect uh, Richmond to the Valley so you could go from Jamestown to Stanton on this completely off-road trail. Um, so I got I got some work to do. But it's, good to have, it's good to have a lot of support. Hi, I'm Jackie Martin. I'm Director of Community Partnerships and Health Equity at UVA Health. I'm Carmelita Wood, President of Midlife Field Nation Associates. I'm Lauren Regal, Executive Director at Charlottesville Community Bikes. <clears throat> um, Todd Rowley, uh, Program Manager at Community Bikes. I'm Marissa Kubiniak. I'm the Store Manager at High Tour Gear Exchange in McIntyre Plaza. I am Chris Ritter. I'm the Special Projects Coordinator with the Charlottesville Albemarle Commission Business Bureau. I'm Albert Kriaplan. I am a Transportation Planner for Albemarle County. I'm Peter Holmes. I live in Belmont. I'm involved in the City Bike Pet Advisory Committee, and I work for <coughs> VDOT doing transportation research on bicycle and pedestrian transit topics. Lonnie Murray. I'm a Planning Commissioner uh, for the Whitehall District in Albemarle and um, also on the Albemarle County National Heritage Committee. And uh, Charles Track Club member and longtime runner, big advocate for protecting um, safe places for running. Hello, I'm uh, Meg Hester. I'm the general manager for Public Lands, uh, the store next to Dick's Sporting Goods. And um, we're very excited to be here. Randy's with me, that works there. And we just, if you haven't been to our store, just a little bit about us, we're, um, we're sort of a, a brainchild of, um, you know, a lot of different people, but Todd Spoleto is our president who was with North Face. And then uh, Mary Stack, who's the daughter of Ed Stack, who's, um, you know, the CEO of Dick Sporting Goods. She's actually an environmental science uh, graduate student at UVA. And this was sort of like her, her love and her passion. So she kind of created this concept and um, we're a 1% for the planet. And Aside from just retail, we, we're very committed to being something different, that we are actually committed to preserving and protecting and celebrating public lands for all. And that includes equity, diversity, inclusivity, conservation, um, and just being a part of the community. We're, we're not just there to sell stuff. We, we wanna actually be involved and do the work that goes along with it. So I'm really excited to be here, so thank you. I'm Katie Darden. I live in Belmont. I volunteer for Livable Seaville and help write the, that group's newsletter and recently started attending the Bike Pet Advisory Committee meetings. And professionally, I work with a Atlanta-based law practice that's focused on at advancing equitable workplace change. Hi, I'm Michael Geisert. I'm a, just a bike pet advocate up in Carsbrook, uh, northern Albemarle. I'm Tanika Irving. I'm the um, Community Benefits Manager at Centera Martha Jefferson, and our um, Centera Grant Portal has opened. So if you're doing any work or know anyone that's doing work around social determinants of health, encourage them to apply. We do have some flyers on the back table. Hi, everyone. My name is Diana Webb, and I'm a Community Health Educator at Centera Martha Jefferson Hospital. Uh, Jamie Powers, live in the northern part of the county. Uh, just started about three weeks ago as climate protection project manager with Albemarle County. Um, and I will say a quick note, having run with Prolific, it is a community and energy unlike anything I've experienced. And if you're a runner, you should definitely check it out. And, and if you're a walker too, they have a walking group. <laughs> it, it, nobody gets left behind on their trips. Hey everyone, I'm Gabe Daly uh, with Elmore County, the Climate Protection Program Manager. Excited to have doubled our climate staff recently. <laughs> um, so our uh, kind of just two main things that, that we work on are implementing the county's climate action plan to reduce uh, greenhouse gas, gas emissions in the community uh, and, and bring other benefits to the community in the process. And then another effort that we're uh, gearing up for is doing climate 
resilience planning, which is more about looking at some of the changes that we expect to see in the coming decades and years, um, and, and you know, doing our best to help uh, build resilience uh, among our community for those kinds of changes. I'm Jessica Hirsch-Bellering. I am a transportation planner for Admiral County. <clears throat> My name is Brian Bench. Um, I'm just here as a resident and interested. I use the trails a lot and uh, live near Southwood. I'm Katie Eppinger with the Community Climate Collaborative and I work on the transportation and, and energy equity campaigns. Hello everybody, Julia Monti, the University Planner UVA. Um, I'm very interested in a lot of connectivity, mobility issues um, and also serve on the NPO Policy Board and on the Community Land Trust with Carmelita. Um, and I spend a lot of time on trails. <laughs> I'm Spencer Phillips. I'm an ecological economist. I worked for many years at um, the Wilderness Society, so great to hear about some of what you guys do. Um, I've been in private practice with Keylog Economics. I still have that going here and in Hanoi, Vietnam. I've lived in Charlottesville off and on for like 40 years, everywhere from the Kent dorm to the Venable Neighborhood Association. Don't hate me, you fraternity neighbors. Um, and Belmont, Ridge Street, Forest Lakes, Fry Spring, and now um, Stonehenge. So I'm, I'm well acquainted with the amazing disappearing bike lanes of Charlottesville. And um, <laughs> hopefully uh, we'll learn more about it here. Also, too, uh, as a, now an assistant professor of global studies at UVA, I've got students who are working on one working on the Three Notch Trail uh, and students who are very interested in the intersections of justice, environmental quality, economic development. And so it sounds like a lot of things you, you all are working on. And we've had, had students doing, you know, urban gardening, heat islands, um, environmental justice work focused on Charlottesville. So we'd be always on the lookout for new research project ideas. Uh, my name is Randy Garrett. I work at Public Lands. Um, you can usually find me on the climbing wall there. And yes, we do have a climbing wall in our retail <laughs> store. Uh, but I do a lot of uh, work with the uh, community outreach group there. And uh, always been passionate about the outdoors and uh, yeah hopefully helping other people to get out too. I'm Allie Hill. I am a board member with the Urbana Trail Foundation, which by the way, we're looking for new board members if anybody's interested. Uh, because, uh, I'm also the chairperson of the Three Nuts Trail going forward. Um, I am on the Virginia Bike Federation. It's a statewide organization. And I also coach the Western Admiral High School mountain bike team. Um, we have 30 plus strong students who are racing this spring. So. I'm Todd Niemeyer, uh, RTF alum, uh, board, former board member, uh, work for the city of Charlottesville and the director of the Human Rights Commission and Office of Human Rights. James? Oh, did you go along? Yep. James? Back to the room? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm Josh Carr. I'm a volunteer with Global Seaville, and I run the Charlottesville e-bike London library. So if you want to try or borrow a bike, talk to me. I have one outside. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, my name is James Bussels. I work with Peter uh, and Brown and Wyatt at PEC, doing advancement and event planning. Uh, yeah, I'm Wyatt Birchaw. I'm also with Piedmont Environmental Council. I joined about a year ago, and I worked with Rob and Peter in the Charlottesville office. Nice to meet you all. Yeah. 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 Thanks for the, the suggestion, and that'll send us off to lunch. And now that you know everybody, you can talk to each other um, and, you know, just kind of this is an opportunity to try and, and seed our next session, which will be to come up with ideas for mobility for the coming year and what collaborations you'd like to see and imagine.